Okay, let's pray over the word. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you that it will find a home in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you want to follow along, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 20. And this morning we're just going to talk about the exceeding greatness of God's power that's available to us who believe. Now in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, there's, two, there's a prayer, two prayers that the Apostle Paul prays for the church at Ephesus that they would come to understand and realize all that belongs to them. You know, how many know as Christians, we, we, know, we know some things, but nobody knows everything about all that belongs to us and about the kingdom of God. And so the only way to know more about God and the things of God is to put the time in, to study, be a student of the word, to meditate on the scriptures, keep coming to church and keep pressing into God. And as you do, that, that wisdom will just flood your life. Even if in the beginning your mind's not quite picking it all up, don't you worry about that. Your spirit's picking it all up. Amen? And soon your spirit will teach your mind exactly what you need to know, right? And so just, but the, the point is you got to keep pushing in there. Keep getting that word in you. Keep being around the spiritual things of God and you will grow supernaturally. And so we're going to see from this scripture that there is an exceeding greatness of God's power. <clears throat> in Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So it tells us that there is an exceedingly abundant power that can, God can do anything that we ask or think. But where's that power at? It's in us. Amen. We got to tap into the power of God that's within us. When you became born again, God downloaded his Holy Spirit within you. You got the power. But if you don't realize it, you won't walk in it, you won't operate in it. And if you don't renew your mind to the word, you'll think like the world, act like the world, and, and, and you'll be basically um, not able to tap into all that God gave you. And so it's up to us, right, to continue to learn and to grow. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 19. It gets better and better every time you search into the scriptures. Now, while you're turning there, I want you to know because a lot of churches and religious churches sort of um, go a different way in this, and so we're not religious, right? We're Christians. I want you to know that when you accepted Jesus Christ, you've been born again in the Spirit. That's the greatest miracle that ever takes place in, in, in the world is when a, when a person goes from death, spiritual, spiritual death to spiritual life in the spirit. The Bible says you're a new creation. You're a brand new being, right? That's what it means to be born again. And God seals you with his Holy Spirit. And he gives you a position as a child, as a son or daughter of the Most High God. And your life is hid in Christ. That's a fact. Now you got to walk that out in victory. You got to walk that out and you got to access the power that God's already put in you. And that's what this message is about here. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ, that's the most beautiful gift. You are born again and nothing's going to ever take that from you. But I want to see you. God's word wants to see you walk in victory. We want to see you overcome things in your life that continually knock you down and not only overcome things in your life, but go ahead and and help other people overcome things in their life. Because that's what God wants. The Bible says we're to be a victorious people. We're to be more than overcomers even. So look at Ephesians 1 verse 19. <clears throat> and this is a prayer of revelation. It said that we may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now this is why I'm saying the word deserves and demands that you meditate on it and that you put your heart into it and also that you humble yourself to the word of God and say, God, show me, mold me, shape me according to your word and to your spirit because this said a lot. And if you would just read it like you're reading some novel and just skim over it, you'll never, ever, 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 ever get the power that that verse just said that you have. Because what that verse just said is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Well, what's the problem then? What devil's bigger than that? I'll tell you, no devil. But if he can convince you up here that he's bigger and stronger and badder and, 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 and somehow God will forsake you or whatever, then he'll defeat you. 
because he gets a hold of your thoughts and your thoughts get into your heart. It's how you see yourself. And then he gets your most valuable, valuable possession next to your heart, which is your words. If you go around saying you're defeated and you're sick and you're a nobody and it'll never get any better and all these things, you, that's exactly what you will be. And you don't have to be that because God's word says you're much more than that, right? If you just tap into that power. But you have a part to play. We're not just here playing church here. I did not come, and I have not been here for over 20 years, just to preach a, a message that somebody says, hey, that was a nice little message, and then go home and, and never grow spiritually. Our job is to raise up spiritual warriors for Christ. Our job is to raise up people who know who they are in Christ, so you can go out there and win some and take authority of the, of the, over the devil who's trying to ruin your life. That's our job, Right? And then when we come in here, we put such a sweet atmosphere of love and joy and peace in here that the Holy Spirit moves freely and people's lives are touched and healed and delivered. That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? Amen. And so, but he mentions um, three words, exceedingly uh, uh, greatness and power. And so um, I want to work off of these three words. Exceedingly in the Greek is the word hyperbalo. It's a compound word, hooper and balo. And hooper describes something that is above and beyond anything else. And balo means to throw or to hurl. So when you put these words together in conjunction, they depict an archer who overshoots his goal. He puts so much energy into it that when he pulls back his bow and releases the arrow, it, he overshoots, surpasses, and eclipses the goal. He's trying to say this exceedingly greatness of his power. It's way more than what any earthly power could ever be. It's exceedingly above it all. And so when an archer has a goal out there and he pulls that bow back and he shoots that arrow, there's so much power behind that arrow, it goes way past the target, way past the goal. And this is what breaking the word of God down, this is how it helps us see a picture here. We're not talking about normal things here. We're talking about supernatural power. You want to know how I've been here for 21 years? Not by my might, not by my strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit within me. The power of God gets you through anything, right? Now, greatness, the seeding greatness of his power, the word greatness is the Greek word magathos. It's a form of the word mega, of course, which means great. But this word would better be translated as vast. So one can say that God's power is so mighty that it's simply beyond human ability to measure. Amen. It's limitless. There's no way we could ever measure or put up uh, some kind of calculated formula about God's power. It's, it's limitless. It's vast. It's great, just like our God, right? Wouldn't that make sense that a great God would have great power? Wouldn't it make sense that the God who said, let there be light, and light was, light came from nothing, and the universes are still expanding? Wouldn't it make sense that that God is pretty great, right? He is the greatest being. He is the ultimate being, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are co-eternal. They are omnipresent. They are omnipowerful, and they are all-knowing. They are, they are our eternal God. And the Holy Spirit lives in me and you. That means I got the same power in me that raised Jesus from the dead. That took a lot of power to raise him up from the dead because you can't do that in the natural that's why, you know, in the beginning when the church first started to grow and, and to go out through the world, the Roman government was okay because they accepted all religions. I mean, if you wanted to worship a butterfly, they said, go at it. Go ahead and worship a butter, butterfly. Put it in a jar. It's called your God. But here came Christianity along, and they're talking about a resurrection power of Jesus Christ who rose from the dead, and without him, you do not have eternal life. They persecuted that. Because the name of Jesus, the devil does not like. Amen? Would you agree that the devil has been persecuting the church for 2,000 years? Has he stopped it yet? Will he ever? I mean, I just prayed and talked to God before I came out here this morning. Uh, and I just want to tell you, everything's okay. He told me everything's okay. 
and he's still on the throne. Nobody knocked him off yet. I don't think they're going to either, are they? And so we're on a winning team. Now, the whole idea now is to find out who am I in Christ? What benefits do I have? What has been given to me to overcome this death and this sickness and this perversion of this world, to rise above the heap and the ashes of this world and to stand out for the glory of God? That's what this message is about, right? And so, and then the word power, of course, is the word dunamis. It describes power and ability, but this word dunamis, it means that there's an in, inherent power with God. Or like in nature, there's an inherent power in a hurricane, right? If a hurricane comes and it produces those winds, there's power already built into it that anything in its way is getting knocked over. Very destructive, right? Right? I'm talking about a Category 5 that comes across the land. It, it, it is, there's an inherent power that nothing can stand in its way. That's the description that it uses for the power of God. It belongs to him. It's who he is. Nothing can stand in the way of our God. That's why he wants us to be bold and to be, to be aggressive and to go out there and, and bring people from death to life by telling them who Jesus is. No greater miracle than when someone gets born again. Would you believe that? So what, what he's saying with these words is the power of God is so mighty that it can't be measured and it can't be resisted. There is simply no human power in existence comparable to it. Christ's resurrection was the greatest manifestation of power that the universe ever witnessed. It was the greatest manif manifestation of that power. No power in hell or on earth was able to resist the demonstration of that power. Imagine that when God raised Jesus from the dead, no devil, no demonic spirit, no principality, no power out there could stop Jesus from rising from the dead, going back into that body, having that body transformed into a glorified body, and then going up to the right hand of the Father. Nothing on earth, nothing in hell, nothing could even stop that power. That takes some power to do that. Well, once again, let me remind you, that resurrection power is in you too. And you're to take that power and overcome all these things in your life that's trying to ruin your life, all that sin and all that destruction that the devil tries to bring into you and all those hurt and the pain. You're to rise up in that power and say, no, it's not going to be that way anymore. I'm going to walk in the power of the name of Jesus. You can do it. My life did not change until I did that. We can't say, well, when God feels sorry for me enough, he'll do something about my life. He already felt sorry for you when he sent Jesus. When he sent Jesus, he gave you everything. Now it's time for you to walk it out. Stop looking for more power and just walk in the power that he gave you and line your heart up with it. Brother Hagin said one day in church, there was a guy up at the altar praying, and he kept saying, more power, more power. So Brother Hagin just topped him, tapped him on the shoulder and said, well, where's he going to get the more power from? He's already given you, given you everything. He's already given you the name of Jesus. He's already given you his son. He's already put his spirit in you. He's already given you the truth of the word of God. What more do you want him to give you? Makes it pretty simple, doesn't it? Maybe I need to know who I am in Christ. Maybe I need to study the scriptures. Maybe I, need, maybe I need to meditate on Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3 this week and maybe a month to get it deep down inside of me so I'm not so scared all the time. So I'm not so down and depressed when life hits me hard all the time that when, when this fear comes or these challenges come, I just rise up and say, well, I know I got the greater one in me and I'm gonna, I'm gonna plow through. Because there's an inherent power in me to conquer anything that this world has to offer. Maybe I'll change. A lot of Christians, they just, they don't, they don't do it through the week. And they come and say, Pastor, here I am, entertain me. I don't want to entertain you. I want to give you the truth of God's word. Amen. I want to tell you exactly what the Holy Spirit told me to tell you. Amen. I want to give you words to live by. I want to give you words to take out of here and, to, and to, to live it out. Walk out your life. 
Because what I'm telling you today is the truth. There is a power, an exceeding greatness of God's power. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and it's in you. Amen? Amen? Now you've got to walk it out. And you've got to have that resolve in you to do it. Amen? No power in hell was able to, to resist that divine energy that raised Jesus from the dead. Now I wanted to show you a picture of, of the Shroud of Turin. And uh, we got it up here. Anybody ever hear the Shroud of Turin? This is the linen burial cloth. Many people you know, speculate about it. I, I absolutely believe it's, it's the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Especially since with new technology coming out, new x-ray vision type technology, they can clearly tell that this burial linen cloth came from 2,000 years ago. It has the blood in it, AB+. Plus. AB+, plus, which is a rare blood type that's found in the Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern um, uh, culture. And there was pollen on the cloth that came from the 2,000 years ago from the, from the region of Jerusalem. If you just want natural facts. Well, that's one thing about technology. As it continues to grow, it doesn't disprove the Bible. It proves it naturally and scientifically, right? And so th let's see the other image there. And then this is the full body. I know it might be hard to see, but that's the full body, the linen, the linen cloth that, that Jesus was, was buried in. Now, it's called the, 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 the cloth of, of Turin because that's where it was found in Italy, the Shroud of Turin. It was found in, the, in Turin, Italy. That's the name of the city. That's, why, that's where the name Turin comes from. And it was found in um, the 1350s. And so, but these new scientific methods have just um, showed us that it was exactly... Um, it was, it was what, what you can see in there, you couldn't see before. Now, the ultraviolet rays that it would have taken to burn that image front and back on, on that shroud of turn, on that linen cloth, it, it, it took a tremendous amount of ultraviolet rays, 10 billion watts worth. Remember now, we're talking about the exceeding greatness of God's power. In other words, the energy that it would have took to imprint that image, you can't duplicate that, you can't replicate it, they've tried. It was the power of God when he, Jesus came back into his body, the resurrection power of God produced that image on that cloth. And the body became transparent, that's why you could see the bones and you could see the structure. On that cloth, it has the, it has the, the crowns of thorn marks on the head of Jesus. It has the, the nails prints in his hand and in his feet. It even has a spear that they stuck in his chest or his upper side. They stuck a spear in him so he would make sure he was dead because the sun was going down and, and the Sabbath was coming. It shows it all. But the reason it could show it all is because it says when this tremendous energy hit that cloth, I wonder what that tremendous energy was. I'll tell you what it was. Resurrection power. Sometimes I think we get lulled into like nothingness. Oh, he raised him from the dead. Woohoo. No, the power that was involved is otherworldly. It's immeasurable. It's not of this world. 10 billion watts of ultraviolet rays would have, it would have taken to burn that image in there without disintegrating the cloth. And, and the experts now are saying that that body would have, became, would have became transparent. Isn't that what the Bible says happens to our body? Amen. Amen. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead? He had, a, he had a body in form, but he could also walk through walls. He already got his glorified body. We're going to get one just like it. Amen. By the same power. Somebody, I mean, say amen to that one because I'm telling you what. That's what we got coming for us. Do you believe that? Now, I wanted to read to you what one expert said. That um, He says, the double image on the front and the back of the cloth, the discovery of an image on both the front and the back of the Shroud of Turin suggests that the cloth may have collapsed through the body, which seems to have become mechanically transparent. So the body's in there, and then this power comes this ultraviolet rays, this power, the resurrection power comes, and then phew, down goes the cloth. And out goes Jesus. Amen. That's what the science says. Amen? This x-ray-like visibility inside the body 
it, it, it shows the, the bones and, and the features inside because it became, it became translucent, transparent as the power of God hit that body. Amen? And so the resurrection of Jesus involved more than just returning to life. His transformed body, he, he transformed into a glorified, transphysical state. Exactly how the Bible describes our bodies are going to be. I got good news. I'm going to share it with you today, too. Amen. And like I said, when Jesus had that new body, he could walk through doors. But you know what else? He, he wasn't a ghost. Amen. He had a glorified body that just, that just rose from the cloth and the cloth collapsed. And that image has been on there ever since. And they can't duplicate that image because they don't have the, the power or the ability to put that kind of an image that was in that cloth. It only came from the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior. And that thing was preserved for years. And immediately people come against that cloth, that burial cloth, and, and the Shroud of Turin. Um, it even survived the fire. It was put in a museum, and there was a fire that burnt the whole museum down, but the shroud wasn't touched because they had it be behind seven layers of bulletproof glass. And it was preserved. And so, yeah, back in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, they're like, well, yeah, it's not really. But then in, in the 2000s that you can see, now they can see, wait a minute, this was a supernatural event that occurred in that man's burial cloth that, 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 that that's would have took 10 billion watts of power to put that image on that cloth. And it would have had to have been a transparent body and it would have had to have collapsed into nothing. So you think that when Jesus went back into his body, it was just a, just a natural event? Oh, here I am again. And let me go ahead and just unroll this stuff off of me. Boom. Walking in his resurrected body. Death could not hold him in the grave. That's why the devil's afraid of the name of Jesus. Because that name is the only name that can cause a person to go from death to life. Amen? So the power of God is going to transform our mortal bodies and change them from natural, corruptible bodies to spiritual, incorruptible bodies in the resurrection of the rapture. And the rapture. Do you believe that? If you don't, let's turn there and let's look at it. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. What I'm, what I'm telling you is that God's got a plan for your life. He's got a glorious plan. The thing is, if you're here today and you can't say that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't walk out those doors if, without knowing Jesus. If you say, well, um, I don't know if I can live that Christian life. What, you can't put your faith in Jesus and trust him? Right? And then you start to walk with Jesus, and he helps you through every obstacle that you have in life. But you got to get the life-changing, transforming power of God in you. you got to go from death to life, spiritual death to spiritual life. And it's the power of God that does that. And that power of God will be with you the whole way through your life, even to the resurrection of your body, or the rapture of your body, whichever, if you're here when Jesus comes back, the power of God's going to hit your body, your, your living body. Do you know the Bible says there's a generation that will not die? They'll be here to see the coming of the Lord. Many of us in here believe that we're all, we are that generation. We believe that we will see that day, right? I mean, we can look at the world and say, man, Jesus, why aren't you back yet? I know why he's not back yet. You know why? He's trying to get the harvest in. Amen. Trying to get the harvest in. Trying to get as many people in because once that door closes, just like they closed the door on the ark. Who closed the door on the ark, by the way? God closed the door. When he closes the door, no man can open it. When God opens the door, no man can close it. One day when he closes the door on this chapter of the church, the church age, he, no one can open it back up. And there will be many, many people that are left behind. To deal with the Antichrist. Not us. Because we're going to have an exceeding greatness of God's power hit our bodies. Amen. And we're going to be transformed into the same glorious body that Jesus had. You're not going to be a ghost. 
You're going to be a real live human being, but not a natural body, a supernatural glorified body just like Jesus has. And that's the power of God. No power on earth can ever do that. That's the, that's the exceedingly abundant power. And I'll prove it to you. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is the Amplified Bible, verse 50. No wonder the Bible is called the good news. Oh, it's very good news. Right? He says, now, I, now, verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15, Now I say this, believers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit or be part of the kingdom of God, nor does perishable mortal inherit imperishable immortal. And so we can't go to heaven in these natural bodies because they're not built for eternity. So that, therefore, you're going to get a, a new glorified body before you even enter into heaven, right? Those people that have gone on before us already, they have a temporary transitional body, but they'll get this glorified body at the resurrection. And God brings their body, their old body, their natural body out of the earth, and then that power of God will hit them and hit their, their, their spiritual body, and when they meet, they'll be changed. Sometimes people get a little... A little um, we're a little dumbed down in our mind about heaven. Am I the only one? You say, well, well, I'll be able to do this. Well, I'll be able to do that. Well, you, uh, what heaven has for you, you won't, don't worry about anything here because it's way better than that. Amen. Right? I ain't worried about golfing in, 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 in heaven. <laughs> I get irritated half the time anyway when I go. <laughs> Because what God has for us, oh my goodness, you're just going to have to get there to see it. You're going to have to believe that this mighty God has a mighty eternity for you. You're going to have to believe that it's literally impossible to be bored in the presence of God. You're going to have to believe that God is so big and so powerful that every day that you, that in heaven, I almost said every day that you wake up, I don't think we're going to go sleep in heaven. Every day, it's not, they're not even days. There's not even a clock. Too bad for the clockmakers because they're out of business. <laughs> it's just life. But the longer eternity goes, the better it will get, and the more of God you will see. And you're not a mist or a vapor or a ghost. You have a glorified body, just like Jesus had when he rose from the dead, to put all that power out. And that power's in you, by the way. So don't walk around and say, woe is me. Hold your head up high and say, I got the power. Amen. Amen. Don't let that hee-haw song be your theme song, gloom, despair, and agony on me. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Nobody sings that song, right? For the younger kids, you can Google hee-haw. <laughs> right? Look at verse 51. He says, listen very carefully. I tell you a mystery, a secret truth decreed by God and previously hidden, but now revealed. We will not all sleep or will not all die because there's going to be a generation that's alive when he comes. Right. But we will all be completely changed, wonderfully transformed. All the believers. Because that's where the power is in those who believe. You say, well, I, I don't. I haven't become a believer. Well, become a believer. Well, how can you do that? Just want it and ask for it of your own free will, right? And then in verse 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. So when it says the dead in Christ will be raised, we have to understand their bodies are in the grave right now. The righteous bodies are in the grave, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It goes back, the body goes back to the ground from which it came, but their spiritual body is in heaven. And one day, their natural bodies coming back out of the grave, I don't care what state it's in, God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, did he not? He's going to reform those bodies and it's going to meet their spiritual body and they're going to be changed. The same power that, that changed Jesus' body will change their bodies. That's the, your eternal body. I don't think we've got anything to be sad about. <laughs> Honestly. 
Amen? Look at verse 53. For this perishable part of us must put on imperishable. And this mortal part of us must put on that which is, the, the mortal part, that which is capable of dying, must put on immortality, which is freedom from death. And when this perishable puts on imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then the scripture will be fulfilled that says, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen? Amen. Vanquished forever. Death will be vanquished forever. So have you lost a loved one that has gone on to heaven before you and there is a separation and that's hard and there's grieving that comes apart with that. But don't you worry. Once you get to heaven with them, once your body's changed just like theirs, you'll never, ever have a separation again. Amen. No more tears. No more sorrow. The old things are gone and you're going to begin the new with your heavenly father. And you know how you got all that? Because God wanted it for you. He's sovereign, and in his sovereign will, he said, I want to make a way for every human being that comes on this earth to know my son and to live in eternity with me forever, with a body that won't get old. Amen? You think sometimes these natural bodies, I mean, you can get in, when, when someone gets older, it doesn't mean that they got to get sicker. Right? You keep standing on the word of God and you keep believing. And, and uh, you know, but when you're younger, you don't have to work at things as much. Does that make sense? When I was 20, believe it or not, 18, 20, I, I could play some basketball. I could jump up and grab the rim. I know, don't look at me now, look at me back then, way back. I mean, I, I, I could run, I could jump. Terry, Brother Terry will tell you. Leslie knows she was there. Lowell, am I lying? No. Okay. <laughs> Who else? Just Penny? I don't know if you knew me that good back then, but hey. Anyway, I could run and, and play basketball. And, and, and a few years ago, the church wanted to have a basketball team. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I can run, I can shoot, I can jump. So I get on out there. And there goes the ball. And my mind says, go get the ball. My, and, and my body said, no, it ain't happening. <laughs> I, I needed to train a little bit more, right? I'm not saying I can't get back to that point, though, because Brother Jeff told me that I can. <laughs> and he's right, because he's in good shape. So. But, but it, it takes more work, right? But, you know, one day... We ain't got to worry about any of that stuff. We're going to be in a supernatural state. Right? Okay. Now, look at Romans 8. Then I'll close with this verse. I'm giving you good news. Amen. So that shroud of Turin took a, a, an ultraviolet ray or that kind of energy that would have needed 10 billion watts to engrave that image on that cloth and not burn it or disintegrate it in any single way. There, that's way more than any power we got here on this earth. It's exceedingly abundantly far more immeasurable power that it took for that body to be transformed into his glorious body. You're getting the same treatment. Amen. Are you a joint heir with Jesus Christ? Yes. That means you get the same inheritance and you get the same body he has. Amen? Now, there's no vacancies in the Trinity now. I don't want anybody to get scared. No vacancies in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But you are a son and daughter of the Most High God. Jesus made you that way when you believed. Amen? Look at Romans 8, verse 11. It says, but if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. This is King James Version. I switched back over, back over. If the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Now, does the spirit of God dwell in you? Yep. Is it the same one that raised Jesus from the dead? Yep. Okay, I am reading that right, right? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, 
We are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, it be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. In the verse 18, this is the part I want you to get, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which we shall which shall be revealed in us it's already in there but it's going to be revealed and it's going to come to its full fruition on that day amen Look at verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's important. It's revealed in us. Does it say revealed on us? Does it say revealed for us? It's revealed because you have the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same spirit was there when God looked at the, at the earth and there was a nothingness. The same spirit that hovered over the, 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 the darkness and God said, let there be light. It's the same power that caused light. It's in you. That means you got to walk like it, act like it, talk like it. But the problem is with a lot of people, it's not realized because they're not willing to, to submit to God. They're not willing to, willing to be reverent. reverent. They're not willing to love like God says to love. They're not willing to yield. You have to yield to the scriptures, yield to the Holy Spirit, or it'll have no effect in you. You've got to say, God, I surrender my everything to you so that I walk in that newness of life. No wonder Paul said, I crucify my body. It's not I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. He didn't want to dampen the power that was in him. But it can't be compared. compared. Everything you're going through can't be compared to the glory. Oh, what glorious days we got ahead. Look at this, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature or creation waiteth for the manifestations of the Son of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Now, there's what he's talking about. The creation is under that same curse, the same dis, 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 uh, disruption that, that sin brought. Even all of creation is groaning and waiting for the day that the sons and daughters are manifested. And it, too, is redeemed from the curse. Amen? Man, God's going to do some big stuff. But in the meantime, let him do some big stuff in you. Amen? If you struggle with anger and you say, well, I'm, I, I'm, just, uh, what's the, who's, I'm just Irish and Irish are hotheads. <laughs> you know, stop labeling yourself as a hothead and start saying it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And I'll overcome that anger by the power of God in me because the same power to raise Jesus from the dead lives in me. I can overcome anything in my flesh. I don't have to be beaten down by the things of the flesh. I can rise above it. Glorify God in every way. Depression. You stand up to that depression and take the power of God that's already in you and say no to that depression and come against it in the name of Jesus and then start filling your mind with the word and filling your heart with the praise of God and you won't be depressed no more. Now, that word was for somebody in here with depression. You go to a natural doctor, they're going to try to pump you with, with drugs. Nothing against medicine. If anybody's on medicine, I'm not saying don't get off your medicine. I'm just saying, you know, try God's way too. God's word is God's medicine, the Bible says. So go ahead and get the medicine of the word of God in you. Go ahead and spend the whole week in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. Meditate on it over and over and over again. You know what it's going to cost you to do that? Time. time. You got the time? I'd make the time if you didn't have the time. Amen? 
So the, all of creation is waiting for this day when our bodies are going to be changed. Amen? Now look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also. Listen to this. Who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies. We have already been given the down payment of, of greater glory. We have the down payment of the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of the Holy Spirit within us. We've already been adopted into the family of God. On that day, the redemption of our bodies, it is the completion of of the adoption process where natural death is no more. And you'll live with your God in eternity. What, a, what an awesome power. Does that sound like a plan? I've seen God do great things with people's lives. But it all starts with knowledge. It all starts with revelation. It all starts with knowing who you are in Christ. That's why you got to get in a good church that preaches the truth of God's word. You got to get in a church that teaches you who you are in Christ. You got to get in a church that's, that the pastor says, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You got to get in a place and you got to study and learn about the resurrection power. I just read it all through the scripture. I'm not making it up, right? This is what God put in my heart to tell you today so that you can rise above anything in your life. If you got a marriage that's wounded and hurt and bruised and battered, you can go ahead and take that power that's in you and you can start believing and praying and exercising your authority and submitting yourself and reverencing yourself before the God and humbling yourself. You got to do that first. Then you could literally, by the power of God, change that marriage. Because I want to tell you right now, your husband is not the enemy. Your wife is not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. What are you going to do with that devil? Are you going to rise up and say, no more devil? And I just want to keep saying this again. The Bible says with meekness, you've got to receive the word of God so that it can engraft itself to you. But too many Christians, the things of God seem like it's not appealing to the flesh. Because you know what God asked you to do? Sacrifice. Give. Forgive. Love even when you're not being loved back. Stop looking at people in the natural. Start looking at them in the spiritual. That's what God asked you to do. And the flesh wants, wants what it wants. The flesh is self-centered. God wants you to be Christ-centered. Remember the story of Naaman, the big war hero, hero of Syria? He got leprosy. And leprosy, there's no cure. And, and, and um, he says uh, he, he has, a, has a, woman, a little girl from Israel that they captured one of her, their villages, and she, she was working for him now as, her, as his servant, but she loved him. And she says, there's a prophet in Israel that can heal that. <laughs> and so... <laughs> He goes, he goes to the king. The king of Syria loved Naaman because he was the man. He was the general that won many battles. And so the king of Syria said, I, I'm going I'm to write a, a letter to the king of Israel and tell him that you're coming and he better heal you. And so the king of Israel gets this letter and he's like, he's trying to pick a fight with me. What's he trying to do? And he, he, he tore his clothes. Back in that day, that they tore their clothes. I don't know why they ripped their clothes and said, ah. He was all, he's trying to pick a fight. And Elisha said, send him down here. Elisha's living out in a tent in the middle of nowhere. He said, send him over here so, so that they'll know that there's a God in Israel. So here comes Naaman pulling into Elijah's tent colony. And Elijah would have traveled. You know how the president travels now? All them, all them big black cars and all that stuff. That's how he would have traveled, except it would have been chariots and horses. He was, a, he was a pretty famous dude, pretty important dude. So he rolls in, and he pops out, and he says, where's Elisha? Where's this man of God? I want healed. And Elisha sends out his servant. And he says, and the servant says, hey, here's what the man of God says. You go dip in the Jordan River seven times, and you're going to be healed. And Naaman got offended. 
See, if you're the type of person that is always offended, God help you. You're going to have to take that power that I've been talking about and overcome that offended spirit. Right? Because the Bible says a person offended is hard won. You can't get anything through to them because they're, all, they're only worried about what happened to them. And so uh, Naaman got angry and he turned and left. And his, his, his servant had to stop him. Because Naaman said, are not the rivers in my homeland better, crystal clear waters, the blue waters, better than this dirty, muddy Jordan River? Because it was a muddy mess. The problem is, there wasn't no healing in his homeland. There wasn't no prophet in his homeland. And so, and so his servant said, look, Naaman, if he had asked you to do something noble or valiant, you would have done it. You would have went out there and defeated 100 men by yourself. I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if he said exactly this word, but he's like pumping him up like, hey, you know, you... You would have done it. Why not just humble yourself, Naaman? Humble yourself and do what the prophet said. So he turned around and went down to the Jordan River, dipped himself in the water seven times. When he came up the seventh time, he had skin like a baby. Amen. He was not only healed, he was made whole. Because leprosy takes fingers and takes parts of your body away. He was made whole. And he went back to Elisha and said, your God is my God now. But here's the moral of the story. So many people think that the things of God that God asks us to do, they think it's muddy water. It's not appealing. When God says, you go ahead and love your husband, even though he's not loving you back, it's, that's a muddy river. I don't want nothing to do with that. I watched Oprah, and she said, I don't have to take that stuff. <laughs> nothing gets Oprah. I don't think. <laughs> I don't have to take that stuff because i got to stand up for myself. I can't be anybody's door, man. Muddy, muddy water, right? But the word of God says you got to love even when you're not being loved. You got to submit, humble yourself to the word, and then the power of God will come alive in you. And you got to sacrifice. And some people say, well, I've given and I've served in the church, and nobody appreciates me. I'm sorry if that's happened because we're humans. I don't mean to overlook anybody, but you know what? God always appreciates you. Amen. And nothing you do will ever be forgotten or dismissed by God. But, but the sacrifice, the giving, the loving, the serving, the spending time in the Word, and, and just cutting out worldly things that's competing for your time, it's all muddy water. Nobody in the world would do that because they don't like that muddy water. But you're a believer. you got the power of God in you. You're able to understand spiritual truths, and you've got to realize that that muddy water is really crystal clear waters of the Spirit. And if you just humble yourself and do what God said to do, Say, enough is enough. It's no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. I'm going to do everything God said to do, and he's going to make something new of me. And then on that glorious day when my body is either raptured or resurrected, I'm going to have that same transforming power of God, that 10 billion watts of, of power that went through Jesus' body. It's going to go through me. I'll probably have hair then. It might make my hair stand up straight. <laughs> What power? What a glorious day we got ahead of us. But you got to believe. Amen? I'm going to ask you if you bow your heads real quick before I go. I want to um, ask you here today, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know him. God wants you to know him, but more importantly, you got to want to know him. And so I'm going to say a salvation prayer. The whole congregation will repeat it. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, you will be saved. Amen? You will be changed immediately in your spirit. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead will, will cause you to be born again. Now all you got to do is walk it out in faith. If you fall down and if you make a mistake, never run from God. Run to him because the blood of Jesus has already been applied to your life. Amen? So say this prayer. Let's everybody say it together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, believe I believe Jesus is your son. He died on the cross for my sins. The cross for my sins. And by your power, by power you, rose you rose him from the dead. And by your power, by your power he's sitting at the right hand of God, hand of God. ever making intercession. For all those who believe, those who believe. In, the in the name of Jesus. Father, I believe. Father, I believe. 
Jesus, come into my life. I humble myself to you. I need you. Cause me to be born again right now. Bring me from death to life. Fill me with your spirit. And I will serve you. And I will love you. And I will honor you. And if I stumble, and if I fall along the way, I will run to you, never from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. You can rise and can have the prayer ministers come up. That's how you get in the kingdom of God right there. Amen. I've been saved for a lot of years, and that still makes me happy. Amen. Amen. And while they're making their way up here, Leslie and I, we, we, we meet with a lot of people, especially people that want to get married. And, and um, sometimes pastors or churches won't marry them because they're, they're living together at the time. And I know that's not the way God said to do it. It's not the most be- beneficial way. But we have a belief that God meets everybody right where he finds them. Amen. And they want to, they're, they're going towards God. So I'm not holding that over anybody's head anybody's head they're going towards God and they're getting married Woo-hoo. <laughs> marriage is a God thing but so many times I've had people we lead them to the Lord too if they're not but so many times um, some either the the man or the woman will have a little bit of a resistance to what we're saying and so, so you just got it takes time just meet with them two three four times but eventually they'll, they'll lighten up and a lot of times it was they're, they're angry with God because of, of a loved one who died. And they felt like, well, why, why didn't God protect this loved one? Why didn't God do this? Why did God let it happen? And so when we explained to them that that was not God's will for that to happen, God loves everybody, right? Amen. We explained to them that they live in a fallen world. There's a curse on this planet. There's a devil out there that steals, kills, and destroys. Even people that are good-hearted people, kind people. doesn't have anything to do with the devil. He'll, he'll destroy whoever he can. And so God picks up the pieces, though. Amen? He picks up the pieces and, and gives us, and once we know who God is and, and who, who we are in Christ, then we can start walking victoriously over the enemy. Amen? You can start, stop blaming God for the bad things and start seeing that you've got an enemy out there. He roams around as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour, and taking the name of Jesus and overcome that name. Amen? Walk in victory. Walk in power. You're always going to have challenges, as long as you're on this earth. You're going to have challenges because it's the fallen world, right? But you can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You can overcome the devil. Amen? You know who I see out there right now? I see a lot of overcomers. I see people that the devil had them down and out. And if it was a standing eight count, you count to ten, he was at nine. And he was about to do ten. And you jumped up on your feet. Because the power of God came into you. And you came to your senses and said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to be this way. I'm going to walk in the power of God. And here you are today. Amen? So never stop believing, never stop praying, and never stop trying to help people because they need it. Amen? If you need prayer, come on up here, okay? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for these precious, precious souls that came. And Lord, I just declare that they are, they are healed, they are saved, they are delivered, they are protected by the name of Jesus, Lord God. No harm will come near them or their family in Jesus' name. And they are healed by the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. And they are happy and whole. And we thank you for it, Lord. And Lord, may you this week lay some soul upon our heart. And may we go out and win that soul for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.